here and then oh, there's my dog going crazy again. Share the right screen if I can find it. Okay, so uh, last time we looked at uh, polynomial interpolation. And so this time, oops, let me speak this thing. This time we're going to uh, look at trigonometric interpolation, which is sometimes goes by the name Fourier series or Fourier analysis. And he'll use those words occasionally in this chapter I saw. But um, I think he calls it trigonometric interpolation because we're in particular looking at taking a finite set of points or nodes and then fitting these trigonometric functions to it. Uh, rather than usually when you do like Fourier series, you think of the function as being a continuous function, you don't sample, you just integrate over the whole thing. So I think that's the distinction. I'm not 100% sure. What, what was your impression? Is that, are you familiar with Fourier analysis and stuff? Have you done that otherwise? Oh, okay. No, not really. <laughs> well, no worries. So some of these things you'll see again, if you ever run into Fourier series and that kind of math at some point in your career. <laughs> so, the, um, so the idea here is we're now talking about a periodic function, a function that repeats over and over again, and that's the, and we're, he's restricting it, which is not, it's, doesn't, with no loss of generality, as they often say, right, is we're restricting it to the period of minus one to one. So if your period is not minus one to one, you just have to rescale your x-coordinate. So period is two, that means it repeats every two, as it were, right? Every two units across the x-axis or written in this way, f of x plus two is equal to f of x. That's what a periodic function means. So you can think of any kind of like wave type thing that repeats over and over again as being periodic. I do note that if you have a function that's restricted solely to minus one to one, you can just pretend that it's periodic outside the interval and use the same kind of analysis, extend it to be periodic. Mm -hmm. That's often done in analysis. So since it's periodic, we should use some kind of basis that's also periodic. And that's what brings us to using sines and cosines or trigonometric fun functions. And we will expand it in this series, which is uh, P of X, which is a constant term plus sines and cosines that have period two. That's uh, the restriction with the K pi X. These functions for every, all integer Ks have period two. This is also the same uh, functional form is also known as a Fourier series. and You'll note here that we're limiting it to n, which could be anything, but here, whatever n is kind of like the cutoff of the highest frequencies that you can represent, the, the, the shortest periods, in other words, so you can represent inside the fixed period that you have. Now, it turns out, uh, the text doesn't really prove this, but it just states without proof that you can, if you use equally spaced nodes, no problem, you have spectral convergence, which I'm still not sure what that particular, <laughs> well, that's defined, but. Converge as well, if you have equally spaced nodes. That's how I'm interpreting spectral convergence in my head. So converge is good, good, <laughs> that's what it. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, and I think this is related to Shannon sampling theorem that says if you have you know n nodes of a periodic, n points of a near periodic function, you can exactly represent that function if it's bandwidth limited to n components in this Fourier series. So that, I think that's related to that, uh, that concept. He doesn't say, that's my own words, he doesn't say that. but. So the text, so actually I should point out there's actually um, n, two n plus one coefficients here, right? Because there's a0 and then there's a, so there's, and then a1 through n and b1 through n. So there's actually two n plus one, or, and that's what he calls capital N. Capital N is the total number of points you need. Um, and they're equally spaced in this way. So we uh, sample the function at these nodes and then we assume the samples can be extended periodically forever in both directions. So given that, um, he asks us then to consider this, what he calls a cardinal, this particular function, this, this is actually the name is called Deer Slate Kernel. He doesn't call it that. There, just if you want to look it up later, you can look up Deer Slate Kernel. There's a nice little Wikipedia page on this thing. Uh, it's actually defined without the two over N, I think in there, but in any event, this, uh, this function has some interesting properties. First of all, it's clearly a trigonometric polynomial degree um, n, right, in period two, right, because we just built it from the same, well, we only have cosines here, but it's at least a subset of what's up here in that polynomial. The other thing, it has a property that, um, that for x goes to zero, this is, uh, whoops, that's a mistake there, that should be one. x goes to zero goes to one, so, it's a, so at least for x equals zero, it acts like a cardinal function that it picks out just the one, and for all other, T sub K, all the other sample points, it's zero. 
And that's hard to see from this series form, but it's easy to see when you, if you rewrite it in this form. Okay, so this allows us to build these same kind of cardinal functions, just like we do with regular polynomials, but with these trigonometric functions now. So they have the same property that they are one at, at a particular sample point. We build it by taking tau of x minus t sub k. So for each t sub k, it's a cardinal function for that t sub k, which allows us to build uh, directly, just by construction again, an interpolating polynomial from sample from n two n plus one sample points in exactly the same way we did with the regular polynomials from uh, regular from polynomials from last time. Uh, right. Why did I call it? Okay, this is what's confusing me is that I put this word polynomial here. This is not a polynomial. <laughs> so, ignore that idea. I put it here too. He doesn't call these trigonometric polynomials, does he? I think he did. Wait. So, yeah, that's see. confusing to me for a moment here. Is that just my mistake? Yeah, it says it's a polynomial. What way is it a polynomial? Okay, it calls it a polynomial. Trigonometric polynomial. Okay, I guess it's just a matter of definition. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitionally calling it that. I, I had no trouble when I was reading that. Didn't, didn't trip up on that at all. But now that I'm saying it, I'm like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> what way is it a polynomial? Yeah. Anyway. I think it's from the definition that it's just a sum yeah. to n of the sines and cosines. Okay. I guess um, in some sense, it is powers of something, as we'll see in a minute. But in any event, um, so I just want to, I did look at some of the exercises in this section. One exercise I looked at is just verifying this fact that, yes, this sum of the, this sum of one half plus the sum of uh, cosines does equal this ratio here, because it's not at all obvious from looking at it that that should be the case. Um, and so what he asks us to do, well, in the exercise, he asks us to consider something uh, z equals e to the 2 pi i k x. I found it easier because I've done this before <laughs> to use the uh, z equals <laughs> e to the i pi k x, because you can tell by just by looking at it, the sum over n of e to the i kx is equal to this, um, this right? Well, that's just by definition of the, this, by the Euler identity, mm -hmm. right? Or by the definition of the complex exponential. Uh, and then all the i, all the sine terms uh, cancel, right? Because one for plus k, one for minus k, uh, sines and even functions, those cancel through just stuff with these cosine ones. And then the plus n minus, or say plus k minus k ones add together, uh, right? Are the same, right? So we just mm -hmm. get two of those. So we have, one plus two, we, so we have exactly this, right? Without, with a, you know, multiply the two and then get rid of the n, right? So, so forgetting about yeah. the one over n, <laughs> right? I can write this one plus two sum over cosine as this, right? And now I'm gonna put z equal to e to the i pi x um, so that I have this as a power, as a series. Now, now see, that's what I was gonna say. It is a polynomial in z, if you, you can look at it that way. So maybe that's why it's called that. Just mm -hmm. didn't when I was reading this. Um, so I can split this into two series, and then I can use the well-known formula for the sum of a geometric series, right? Um, and so I just do all that, and there's a bunch of algebra involved, <laughs> which is no fun at all. And you end up with this expression here. And the trick here to get finally to the final expression here is to recognize what I really want is, uh, you know, a plus and a minus exponent term down here so I can get cosines and sines. Well, I want sines, I know that. So if you multiply the top and bottom by z to the minus one half and do more algebra, it's kind of a mess, <laughs> but eventually you get to, <laughs> it's, it's just, I just wrote out longhand, that's why it's such a mess, but in the end you get to this expression right here. So you get to, oh, this one here should be one look at. So I can z to the minus one half, minus z to the one half, and then I got the numerator, the z to the minus n, or that's what I had up here. Uh, but at those one halves are in there. Then you do, now I go back, put z back in what it mm -hmm. was, right? Which is this e to the i pi, whatever's in there. Uh, and you get this expression, which you can immediately recognize as, you know, this is a sine, that's cosine, just from, again, the Euler identities for that complex exponentials. And then you get this, and you recognize that as 2n plus 1, which is capital N, and finally we get we wanted to get out of there.
All right. <laughs> going through all that, I realized probably wasn't that, that helpful now that I think about it, because you can't, either you have to go through it so slow, it would take too long, or, <laughs> or you have to skim over a bunch of stuff, and it's not really that illuminating. But it's actually not that bad. It's nice to see, at least it's nice to see, it's just algebra to get that expression. It's not like some, you know, complicated derivation to somehow, it looks like magic. Like, how do you get this from that? But it's, right. Uh, the, the, I guess the key thing is to know this, there's going to be a sum taking advantage of this geometric ser series thing. This formula that sum over z to the n is one minus z to the n plus one over one minus z, which is one of those things you mm -hmm. want to, you know, put on a sticker and put on your notebook somewhere because it just comes up so often. <laughs> it's like, that's how you do like uh, uh, interest stuff too, same way, right? Cumulative returns and all that, same, you can do the same series. Okay, so just to look at example one of these, this is just gonna, this is just using the um, function in the FNC library that does a trigonometric interpretation. And I'm not gonna go through the code that's in there, you saw it, I'm sure too. But just as an example, we can put some, we can see what one of the cardinal functions looks like by putting in y that's all zero except at one point. And I'll pick out uh, one of the cardinal functions, actually the cardinal function for uh, x equals zero. And you can see this is what it looks like, like a little, almost like a sync function, but it's not. <laughs> and it's zero at all the other points that we want it to be except for at that one. That's what they, they all look like this with different, um, but, but at one at different points, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's just actually that's just copied right from the book. So that's nothing that's new. Uh, so then he gives us some examples. There's one other exercise I want to look at. He, he looks at. I only did one of them. B. Uh, so these he's, this the functions are two periodic, and this is one example of one. It's log two plus sine three pi x. And so we're supposed to plot the function along with this trig interpolant for three, six, and nine, and also compute the max norm. Uh, by sampling at a thousand or more points and making some kind of convergence plot, right? Like they did in a, so this is pretty much close to the same thing they do in the text, we're just doing with our own function. Um, and so let's see, so I define the function. There's my test points for, for plotting functions, not my sample points. Then for, I just did this in a copy and paste way. So for n equals three, right? Calculate the trig interpolation. For n equals six, calculate the trig interpolation, n equals nine and then plot the actual true function as well. So this is what you get. So for any, so the true function is this purple line in here. And you can see like for n equals three, cutting off at n equals three does a very poor job. Doesn't have high enough frequency content to look at all like the original function. For n equals, except at the few sample points, so we, I should have plotted the sample points. So I'd be clear what's going on, I just realized. So clearly there's a sample point there, 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 and there, I guess. No, there's only three, so one, mm -hmm. two, must be a simple point here, here, and here, right? That I'm matching. What well, crosses the purple one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like minus point six zero and point yeah. eight nine or something. Right. So I added it. So you go to higher and higher number of points, and you get better and better interpolation. But for n equals nine, it's already pretty close to matching the thing. So let's see. So yeah, as you add higher and higher frequency components, the interpolate gets closer and closer. Oh, and then the next step is to calculate this convergence thing. So this is just a matter of going through for, if you sit, want to do for n equals two, two points all the way up to 120 points. Um, so this code is, I, you know, I pretty much just cut and paste this out of the chapter <laughs> where they did the same exact exercise for some other function. And so I'm not gonna go through it too much, but I just changed the thing. So it would match what we're doing here. Um, and you can see that it converges quite nicely and smoothly. And apparently that's spectrally converged. Never, never reaches the bottom and then comes back up. It goes right down to the noise floor, which is cool. Yeah, so there's no instability. And again, the text states this is spectral convergence, which someday I might think about trying to <laughs> I was going to say, I will go look at, but I probably won't. <laughs> probably should, but I probably won't. Uh, let's see. Uh, I didn't. I don't know why it's named that, but the plot from the section before this was pretty helpful. Yeah. That the spectral is linear and log linear. Yeah. And algebraic is linear and log log. Right. Yeah. No, I get the definition. I just don't know why it's called spectrally, but it's kind of silly. 
I don't know. Right. Why is it called algebraic? The other one. Good question. <laughs> Good question. So I don't know the answer to. <laughs> so this is exercise 955, which talks about this thing called Gibbs phenomena. Uh, so again, spectral, the, the point here is in order for the convergence to be spectral, the function that we're interpolating has to be analytic, has to have derivatives to all orders. If the function is not analytic, the convergence may not be as good. Um, in particular, there will, you'll find this overshoot near the discontinuities, and that's called the Gibbs phenomena. So he just gives, has just a simple example in this exercise of a function like a square wave. Whoops, I should have done that. I forgot to move the package. I don't have to do that. I was just going to like show the thing, but I went next to like hit the calculate button. That's where I try to find where I was. But in any event, it's a square way with a, it just goes, it's just zero until it hits epsilon. I don't know why the epsilon, that's what they said to do in the exercise. I do know if you don't use the epsilon, it doesn't look as nice to plot. So <laughs> that's as far as I can explain that. It helps all the crossover points line up better. Did you do this one? No, I didn't do any exercises. I only went through the. Well, anyway, we can just move right. So again, this is the same code kind of cut and paste from before um, being reused. But now I'm considering uh, 30, 80, 180 uh, points on the uh, square wave there from goes to zero. So the function starts at zero and this does a sudden jump up to one at x equals epsilon. And if you use x equals epsilon as a crossover, all these little points cross right here at this edge, which is really nice. I mean, that, that, that's why. Why that does that, I don't know. If you put it to not equal to epsilon, they kind of cross all over the place. So that's probably why they wanted to do it that way. In any event, you can see that as we use more and more points, the uh, this you know first this oh this is zoomed way in okay this is 0.05 to 0.15 so I'm zoomed really close in on the edge so we can see the phenomena and for like n equals 30 points it's you know you can see it kind of waves up and down it doesn't really go up very fast as we use more and more ends the it reproduces this edge going up faster you know more suddenly but it rings it has this like these wiggles at the top and the phenomena is that as you go higher and higher n the wiggles get closer and closer together and it goes in the way it captures this edge, it goes up faster and faster and faster. The width of this transition region gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but this difference, this peak never comes down. This overshoot reaches a constant mm. value. Hmm. Uh, so this is 180 points already. You can see it's not, there's no sign of it, even from 30 to 80 to 180, there's no sign of it getting any smaller, the overshoot. And, and the theory is it never does, so we can zoom way in and see how much the overshoot is. You can see it's uh, 1.28, so it's quite big. <laughs> but the area, if you integrate up the area that's occupied by this overshoot, gets smaller and smaller and smaller as well. But, but in practice, um, it's just something you have to live with, but it doesn't necessarily limit you. One weird thing is this value, 1.28. I looked this up on Wikipedia and the Gibbs phenomenon. It says that the limit should be 9% of the full jump. So it seems like I should have got 1.18, but I got 1.28. So I don't know. I played around a little bit. I couldn't figure out why. If anyone watching this or if uh, you have any ideas, <laughs> let me know. Okay, so uh, so far uh, we constructed the trig interpolation directly using those cardinal functions, Dirichlet kernel. We actually never calculated what these coefficients were, the a sub k, b sub k, a zero. We don't, we don't need them necessarily to construct the interpolant. Um, but it is interesting to look that we have n points, 2n plus 1 points, and we have 2n plus 1 coefficients. So there's some kind of mapping between the 2n, the n, capital N, sample points and these n coefficients. And that mapping is called um, uh, discrete Fourier transform because you're going, that's uh, because you're going to this Fourier series basis, kind of like a change of basis from x basis to frequency basis is what you're doing. Um, let's see. We could, in principle, find out what those coefficients are by using that sum form of the cardinal function, right? There was a sum of, you know, C A zero plus all the sum of sines and cosines. If we plug that in, we could expand out and use trig identities to get it into this form that looks like this um, and find out what those coefficients are. But trig, trig identities are a pain to work with. The main, the main issue is the phase, right? So each of the, for each, uh, 
cardinal function, you have to put like x minus t sub k in here. And then you got like, oh, I got to look up that identity for something cosine of two, a uh, difference of two angles or whatever. Same thing for sine. It's, you know, it gets messy. But the nice thing is we can just use this complex form where all those things become much easier to use. Um, so that's what we do. Instead, we start with this complex form of the interpolating polynomial where uh, we have these complex coefficients c sub k, which are made up of these previous components a and b, right? So c sub zero is just a zero over two, and then you can, it's just a matter of matching terms to figure out what they have to be, right? So if I need, you know, I need the uh, um, whatever the a part is going to be the cosine part of this, and whatever the b part is going to be the sine part of this complex exponential, right? And the other, and the uh, you may. It, and the, uh, the ones for k less than zero are just a complex conjugate of these. So we don't have more coefficients. It would seem like, oh, I've got two n plus one complex numbers, but they're restricted in that the negative k ones are the complex conjugate of the positive k ones for real functions anyway. You can have complex functions that you can do interpolation on and all these numbers are completely arbitrary. In any event, uh, the, these, these Coefficients are determined by interp by the interpolating by the interpolation nodes, right? The, two, the n nodes, like I said before. Uh, so you can write out the cart like we did before in that exercise. We can write out the cardinal functions as this sum over exponentials, which means we could just, like I said, plug in and find out what those c sub k coefficients are by just looking looking at them, right? Identifying them in the expansion. But um, I already said that discrete Fourier transform thing. But the standard, uh, standard, uh, straightforward, I should say, not standard, but a straightforward way, another straightforward way, besides what I just said, is just to evaluate the complex exponential at the end nodes and get this kind of van der Maan style matrix, right, powers of z, uh, which can be inverted to solve for the coefficients. But that's very inefficient. It's order of n squared. And it turns out what he says, one of the most important algorithmic observations in the 20th century <laughs> is that there does exist this algorithm called the fast Fourier transform, or FFT, that computes this discrete Fourier transform in order n log n, which is much faster than n squared operations. And he doesn't tell you how it works, but he does say that there's a nice package that does it that you can get. <laughs> uh, uh, there's some weird differences what we've been doing. It uses, instead of minus one to one, it uses zero to two. Well, that's not so weird. And then when it gets the coefficients back to you, it puts them in this, this order here. So that's just something to be aware of. And then he has us do an example here. This I just defined this function so I can get rid of uh, Get rid of small numbers. <laughs> Take the output a little better. So we define this. Now this function right here is a function of x. It's got um, three times two pi x. So it's got the two pi frequency component, and it's got a one pi uh, frequency component. But like I just said, this is not a complex function. I right? just we just got done. We just got done. Uh, uh, talking about real function, all of a sudden, this is from the book too. He throws this complex function at us, right? <laughs> so this function is complex by construction. Uh, and the reason why he does that is gonna be clear in a minute. So we can sample the function and then we can compute the FFT and then look at what the coefficients are. So that's what we'll do. Okay, so here they are. So should be no surprise, but for the two pi components, uh, as I said, right, there's the C sub two, CK sub two, right, is a complex conjugate of CK, so minus two. In fact, they're basically both the same because these imaginary parts are so small, but, right, so that's the cosine component. And this lone C sub, K, C sub one is this, 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 the component from this part right here, which is the complex part of this function. So that's the demonstration of how it works, right? All the other coefficients are near zero because there's no frequency content there. Let's see, he said, for his greatest contribution in mathematics was the point out that every periodic function is just a combination of frequencies. So, okay, well, that's the Fourier series, right? Oh, and so for example of that, he says, let's look at the FFT of this function, which is not clearly obviously made out of, you know, the other, we, here we explicitly made a function made out of sines and cosines and I times sine as well, right? But um, here we're gonna use a function that doesn't look like it's made out of sines and cosines, but we can still, look at the Fourier coefficients for it. And it has these Fourier coefficients. There, there's no obvious uh, 
single peaked frequencies or anything, but this is the coefficient you can use to reconstruct that function up to a certain bandwidth. And so that was just a brief intro. And he says at the end of this section that, hey, this, the application of this kind of analysis, Fourier analysis is very far reaching. And it really is. I mean, if you do any, I mean, I've, I've used Fourier analysis a lot in my previous life <laughs> as a, you know, advising engineers and also in my, in my hobby of doing music signal processing and analysis. So it comes up a lot. Now, the next two sections are about applications of global function approximation to integration. And I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. So, because first of all, I think it was kind of high level. And second of all, it's not that interesting to me as the, as the 4A stuff. But, <laughs> uh, so, he wanted us first to recall that all of the numerical integration we looked at so far it looks something like this. You sample the function at some, some points, right? And you multiply it by some weight at those points. Whatever integration you're doing, numerical integration, this is what you end up doing in the end. Question what those weights are, which points you sample at, that determines your integration method that you're using, right? The, the, the procedure we use to find methods is to interpolate in some way and then integrate. And the key observation he makes here is if the integrand is uh, approximated in a spectrally accurate way, then the integration formula itself will result in spectrally accurate integration. So he mentions that for periodic functions, we can use trig interpolation, just find the Fourier series or the trig interpolation, and then integrate those. But it turns out that the, this just gets you the trapezoid formula. <laughs> Nothing new is learned from this, other than that periodic functions, for periodic functions anyway, trapezoid integration is strictly accurate since the trapezoid, uh, since the trigonometric interpolation is also spectrally accurate. So that's the main conclusion of that part. It does give us a new method, but it gives us more information about the method we already had. The second thing he talks about is, uh, okay, now let's forget about periodic functions, let's go back to the smooth functions. So if F is smooth, then we can clearly get a spectrally accurate integration method by using uh, that interpolating method on the Chevy shift points we talked about back last week. Um, so you can do this, and I'm not going to reproduce it here, but you can, it's in the book, you can do this, you can use Lagrange form of the cardinal functions and find the weights by just integrating those Lagrange cardinal functions, right? So that's that method. Then he talks about another method, well, called the Gauss-Legendre method. And the point there was that the Chevy shift points are great for interpolating, but maybe they're not the ideal points for finding integrals. So it's possible to find weights and points such that the integration is exact, right? Or sorry, is better. And the way you do that is find weights and points that the integration formula is an exact integration for polynomials up to some desired degree. So you make it so that for polynomials up to let's say degree five, the integration formula gives the exact answer for those polynomials and you apply that to any function um, after that. The details, like I said here are messy. <laughs> so I'm not gonna reproduce them. But in fact, they've already kind of swapped out a short-term memory. And I don't remember exactly how it worked, but it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so it turns out that the roots of the genre polynomials give you the ideal nodes for this, for an endpoint uh, Gaussian integration formula. And it turns out also that there are fast formulas for computing the weights from the nodes. So that's details again are in the text. I don't know if you want to talk about any more than that, but that's my quick coverage of that ask, that thing. The, um, so the point out there's these two methods, Clenshaw, Curtis, and Gauss, Legendre, they're especially accurate. Um, one observation he makes is that the Clenshaw, Curtis is on, has n plus one points uh, and gives you a degree n polynomial where the Gauss, Legendre gives you two n minus one uh, po uh, polynomial. But he said this doesn't necessarily mean it's twice as fast for reasons that aren't clear to me, but it just, because it's a different construction, I suppose. So just as a demo, I looked at this one from the text. This is, uh, this is also in the text. And it just compares um, the Glenshaw Curtis with the uh, Gauss Legendre. And they pretty much track pretty well until you get to a large, very large number of modes. And in, in the, uh, well, the Gauss Legendre does do better. Maybe not twice as better, but it does do better. I don't know. That's what I got of that anyway. He also compared it in the text to, um, which I found interesting is that this, like, in particular, that the adaptive algorithm, which finds, tries to, like, 
find points. Remember what the adaptive algorithm tries to do? It tries to set the node spacing so that the integral converges as fast as it can, right? I mean, that's what I thought. But it is just fourth order. And so it is kind of restricted as you go. It's fourth order no matter how many nodes you have. Whereas these, these make higher and higher order integrations for higher and higher nodes. So it's clear that um, these spectrally accurate methods are much better <laughs> in many cases than a runji cut or another fourth order adaptive method that we've talked about before. But he does say that there, there are often cases where the adaptive thing is better. For example, is if the function, the way it varies, varies a lot. Like it's you know, a lot of wiggles over here, a lot of smoothness over here, then you need to use perhaps an adaptive method. Otherwise, these spectral methods will end up, because the spectral method picks the points independent of what the function looks like, it has no concern at all. It picks the points entirely by the roots of Legendre polynomials. So that may not be particularly ideal for a function that wiggles really fast over here and then out over there, where you end up with a lot too many points in the other area. So he says choice is problem dependent, which is always the case. So you have to like, you know, try different things, I suppose. But if you just need to pull something off the shelf, it seems like this, these spectrally accurate, method, accurate methods seem good to use. Okay, so the last section in this, I think, last section in this chapter is improper integrals. And this is, these are integrals where one of the limits is unbounded. Um, so certainly one of the, one thing you can just do is, and in some ways you have to do is just, you know, pick some big number and use that as your limits because you can't really integrate to infinity. The problem is that some functions may fall off very, very slowly and you'd have to use a really, really big uh, range of integration in order to capture, in order to get an accurate answer. So he talks about this transformation, this double exponential transformation as one approach where you transform the variable X to a variable T that has, you know, just applying the hyperbolic sign twice to T. And you just, you know, straightforward integration, uh, change of variables, you, you, you can, Turn the integral into this integral of terms of t now, which is yeah, these has these hyperbolic uh, functions out here, but the big part is it uh, the f itself will be going to zero much much faster now thanks to this x of t uh, coordinate in there. So that's very quickly what that's about. Um, so he takes a look at this integral one over one plus x squared, which does not fall off very quickly at all. And does a double. So if you look at the uh, integrand, one over one plus x squared originally, you can see like from minus four to four, it's just, you know, it's still pretty big. And I'm probably gonna have to go really, really far in order to make this, uh, to capture all the area. But the transformed integrand looks like this. It includes that, the, uh, the change of variables part too, which you might think would start to blow up again, but it, this uh, putting it inside the function arguments overshadows that. So you see by the time you get to minus four and plus four, there's hardly anything left in the integrand. So we can just cut the integral off from minus four to four and get a pretty accurate answer, we would think, right? Um, so this, all this right here is just from the book. I just copied it in there. So I'm not gonna talk about it in any big detail, but the, what I got out of this is that these are both um, fourth order methods. It's just that with less nodes, I can get a much more accurate answer with my double exponential. Uh, like for example, I use thousand nodes, I get error 10 to the minus 10, where here the error is like 10 to the minus seven or something like that. And this is not, I should be clear, this is um, trying its best to, the integration limits that I'm using here, well, I guess that's partially because I have to use integration limits that go from minus two over the tolerance to two over the tolerance in order to capture all the integram. So even though I'm using adaptive integration, I'm still having to use a lot more points probably to capture the same area. Or I should say another way, a lot of these points are not being are wasted. So in order to get to an error 10 minus 10, I have to use you know, 10 times as many points almost and because most of those points are just not doing much work for me. Another case uh, we have to worry about the function approaching infinity is another case where you have like a singularity uh, where F, approaches infinity as x approaches some finite endpoint. So that's a similar problem. But now the integral is finite, but now as x goes to one of the limits, the function inside the integral, the integrand, diverges. And the, the, the trick here is just to use a change of variables to turn the integral into an improper integral using a similar kind of transformation. Um, he uses this one right here. This is for the case where x is unbounded as it goes to zero. But I think you know at some point that you can probably design things that fit your particular problem pretty straightforward once you understand the principle here. 
doing, trying to find some kind of double exponential. And this transforms the limits from zero to one to zero to infinity, it also swaps the order. So this infinity is actually goes along with that zero, by the way. Yes. So there's an exercise where he asks us to do that for this function, which is almost the same kind of function, just with plus x to the fourth. Um, except the difference is we're going, oh, sorry, we're going from zero to one. What was the actual exercise? Sorry, let me just check here. So it's been a while since I looked at this. I mean, by a while, I mean, like it was like, like three days ago, which is already so far. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, sorry, this is, the, this, this is an exercise having to do with the first part of this, the improper integral. So this is integral from um, minus infinity to infinity of one over one plus x triples x to the fourth. So I, the exact value is pi over square root of three. So this is just, again, just reproducing, just copying and pasting the, whatever was in the, the same code, essentially that was in the book for their example and just doing it as an exercise. So it's pretty straightforward. It's not really worth dwelling on, I don't think. So that's pretty much it, right? Is there something else I want to say about that? All right. I don't think so. So, I mean, to me, this section, this whole chapter was interesting. I like the, the discussion of the cardinal function. I hadn't really seen it done now, especially with respect to the Fourier, I'm sorry, the trigonometric polynomials, uh, seen it yeah. done that way with, with um, um, where's my stop share? There we go. With cardinal functions. So that was interesting. Um, I, I don't know, I find the integral stuff kind of dry and not that interesting. It's, like, <laughs> I mean, it's nice to know how they work, but I just feel like I'm not going to be designing these algorithms and I'm worried about other things. So I'm happy that other people have thought very hard about this and have tools available. I guess the advantage is you actually now will know a little bit more about when you're doing one of, you know, using one of these libraries and some error comes up, you might I'm hoping that I'll understand it better. <laughs> right? Oh, wait a minute, this makes sense. I see what it means by solely yeah. or something, right? Yeah. Or did you did you get is that yeah. what you get out of this too? Do you agree with that analysis of the word? Yeah, I agree. I think I haven't really seen this stuff before, so it's kind of like just trying to keep up and soak it in, <laughs> but I haven't really had time to like really understand it. That makes sense. Yeah, I agree. Um, 